Good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to welcome you and um, bring us to order today. I'm Sarah Avravaya Stein, and I have the honor of holding the Viterbi Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies here at UCLA, and I'm the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Director of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. So welcome. Um, and on behalf of our center, I want to welcome you to tonight's Viterbi program in Mediterranean Jewish Studies. Uh, we welcome my dear friend and colleague for many years, Dr. Francesca Trivellato from the Institute for Advanced Studies, um, who is speaking on the topic, The Merchant of Venice and the Western Sephardic Diaspora Fiction and History. And I will say a little bit more about her and, um, and um, her research in a moment. But first, I want to thank the various parties that had a hand in bringing her to us today. Um, the History Department, the Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies, and our wonderful staff um, who always do such a marvelous job. Thank you all. Um, you'll find in the back some flyers for some upcoming events. We have a, have a very busy spring, uh, including um, an event this Thursday on anti-Semitism in America. And so please um, help yourself in RSVP. Um, I invite you to silence anything you have that makes noise. <laughs> And um, I will then um, introduce our guest. So Francesca Trivellato and I met um, some years ago with a shared kinship um, for uh, archival research, Sephardic history, uh, storytelling, and um, sharing each other's company at conferences and events. And it's lovely to have her company here. She is the Andrew W. Mellon um, Chair of European of or, excuse me, of Early Modern European History at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, and the author most recently of um, the 2019 book entitled The Promise and Peril of Credit, What a Forgotten Legend About Jews in Finance Tells Us About the Making of European Commercial Society. It is the winner of the 2020 Jacques Barzun Prize in Cultural History. Her earlier scholarship is known to so many of us in the room um, influential as it is in a study of the early modern world, of Sephardic history, of the Mediterranean, of uh, the economy, and of so much more. Um, Dr. Trivellato is co-founder and co-editor of Capitalism, a Journal of History and Economics. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us and welcome her to join us today, and she will be taking questions and answers afterwards. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Viterbi. It's a real pleasure, a genuine pleasure to be here, to see many old friends and meet new colleagues. As uh, Sarah mentioned, I have been uh, studying uh, Jewish merchants in the early modern period uh, for some time, and almost invariably at the end of our presentations, I will be asked about Shylock. And I usually, um, you know, I used to mumble something because uh, it is impossible to address the topic in any satisfactory, concise, and coherent way. So I finally decided to try my hand at the topic, and this is the result. Um, let me see, how do I do this? Okay. Shakespeare's Merchants of Merchant of Venice is an enthralling and complex text. The commentary on it is immense, and I have no intention of offering a new reading of this dazzling play or debating the many ways in which it reflects, distorts, and generates historical realities. My ambition is more modest. I wish to take you from its most enigmatic passage in order to revisit a crucial aspect of the Jewish experience in early modern Europe that is rarely discussed, at least in the terms I will outline, and in so doing, to illustrate a fundamental way in which the Jewish experience matters about to how we think about the development of Western capitalism. Now, I'm sure that many of you will remember the plot of The Merchant of Venice, but uh, bear with me. I thought it might be useful to recapitulate it briefly. Bassanio is a young gentleman who has squandered his fortune and needs cash to pursue his love interest, Portia, an heiress who reciprocates his feeling. Bassanio's dear friend Antonio, an upstanding Venetian patrician and merchant, is ready to lend him money 
but is momentarily short of liquidity and assets to mortgage. To mortgage is short of liquidity and assets to mortgage. Antonio decides to borrow the sum needed by Bassanio from the nefarious Jewish money lender Shylock, and famously agrees to offer a pound of his flesh as collateral, putting his line uh, his life on line for his friend. In the play's climatic scene, Shylock demands the pound of flesh before the highest Venetian tribunal because the loan has come due and Antonio has failed to repay it in time. Portia is moved by Bassanio's angst at the prospect that his friend might die on his behalf and tells Bassanio to offer Shylock double the sum that is due by Antonio as repayment. But a Jewish money lender persists in demanding Antonio's flesh in the Christian imaginations, uh, Jews are obstinate, which is a not very kind way of saying stubborn. They're stubborn because they do not convert, they do not accept Christ's revelation. In an, up, in an unexpected twist, Portia storms into the courtroom dressed as a male lawyer in order to try and save Antonio, whose death would break Bassanio's heart. She is fully informed about the terms of the dispute, and in fact, she will succeed and prevail, ensuring that the comedy doesn't turn into tragedy. But she appears confused on one detail. As the doge who presides over the trial invites the two litigants, Antonio and Shylock, to come forward, Portia asks, which is the merchant here, and which the Jew? For a long time, Literary critics consider this question either tangential or indecipherable. What did Shakespeare have in mind? How can have Portia possibly been unable to tell a Jew from a Christian merchant in 16th century Venice where such distinctions were enshrined in sumptuary laws? The consensus today is that in fact, Portia's seemingly unfathomable words are crucial to understanding the overall play since they voice a weighty and thorny problem which assailed Christian society at the time. What David Nuremberg has called a crisis of identification. To date, this crisis has been interpreted largely through a religious prism. The semi-coerced baptism of Jews in Spain following the pogrom of 1391 and the forced conversions decreed in 1492 created a new category of people, the so-called New Christians, whose sincere allegiance to Catholicism, the very authorities which had demanded their baptism, doubted. In 1929, Cecil Roth, the great um, Anglo scholar of Italian and Spanish Jews um, wrote that as a result of the mass conversions in Spain and Portugal, quote, for the first time in history, there existed a body of Jews who were indistinguishable in all but their religion, which they seducedly dissimulated, from the general inhabitants of the country. They resembled them in costume and in language and in culture. They followed the same occupations. They share their intellectual outlook and interest in which they frequently excelled. Fast forward to 1982, and Joseph uh, Haim Yerushalmi put it, quote, the traditional mistrust of the Jew as outsider gave way to an even more alarming fear of the converso as insider. This fear of Jews' ostensible invisibility was pervasive and consequential. A new apparatus of repression emerged to eradicate the presence of putatively crypto Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, and new forms of race thinking accompany the process. Identification was so central to the working of old regime societies in which status ascription defined each individual's privileges and obligations that a crisis of identification was tantamount to a general societal crisis. If someone who was a Jew at heart could pass for a loyal Christian, how could the superiority of Christ's religions be demonstrated? 
many an influential scholar. I already cited Roth and Yerushalmi, but one could add Ravab and Zion Netanyahu and countless others have dissected every aspect of the construction of new Christians as the internal religious enemy in Iberia. Today I would like to examine a related but different declension of the Christian fear of Jews' perceived invisibility, one that stemmed from the unprecedented legal status that was granted to Iberian exiles in a few cities of Western Europe where they were allowed to resettle on account of their far-flung commercial and banking connections. I will stress the similarities, but also the differences between the forms of accommodations, accommodation devised for new Christians in five cities, which were the capitals of the Western Sephardic diaspora in early modern Europe, Bordeaux, Venice, Amsterdam, and later London, and for brevity, I'm omitting Hamburg. Most known Marxist grand narratives of the rise of Western capitalism center on what in 1961 Sir Henry Maine famously called the movement from status to contract. That is the evolution from a society of segregated groups in which supposedly natural hierarchies between men and women, between rich and poor, city dwellers and peasants, religious majority and minorities and so on, conditions one's own legal prerogatives and social opportunities, a movement from that world of status to impersonal modern societies in which every citizen, in principle, is afforded the same rights and the freedom of entering into contract with whomever one chooses allows individuals to break away from the mold of kin, village, and small-scale groups of belonging. Taken together, the work of the, during the last two or three generations, the work of social historians of medieval and early modern Europe has challenged this linear trajectory and emphasized the mixture of collectivism and individualism that existed at the time. This rich line of inquiry, however, has rarely intersected with the scholarship on Jewish history, which addresses the same set of issues under the heading of the path to emancipation and its consequences. Emancipation being the formal turning point from status to contract, at least for adult Jewish men of means. The Sephardic diaspora in Western Europe complicates standard accounts of Jewish emancipation and has inspired a literature on so-called port Jews. The expression was coined simultaneously by Lois Dubin and David Sorkin in 1999, and does not refer simply to Jews residing in port cities, but denotes a distinctive experience of acculturation to Christian mores, mores and uh, integration into local society. As the argument goes, during the 18th century, Jews in Trieste, following Dubin, and Sephardim in Bordeaux and Amsterdam, following Sorkin, experienced a gradual movement from status to contract. So much so that for them, emancipation was, in Sorkin's words, quote, not a rupture or a radical departure, but merely a completion of a process that had begun two centuries before. This bold thesis rests on an ideal type description of the living conditions of Sephardic Jews in these European cities. It glosses over the interplay of elements of status, subordination, and contract equality that define their experiences, an interplay that, as I hope to show, matters both for the history of Jews and for the history of European capitalism. So let me turn to the five cities and dig deeper into the institutional arrangements that each conceived to entice new Christians seeking refuge from the Iberian Peninsula. And I'm going to start from Bordeaux because we often forget that Iberia was not the only region in Europe where crypto-Judaism was an institutionalized reality. The difference between Iberia and France is that the monarchy and the 
Gallican Church never allowed the Pope to establish the modern Inquisition in the French kingdom. As a result, when in 1550, the French king invited merchants and other Portuguese known as New Christians to settle in Bordeaux and neighboring, and neighboring towns, these exiles knew that there they would not face the risk of being burnt at the stake. Jews had been expelled definitely from France in 1390, and even in the Southwest until 1723, the open practice of Judaism was not allowed. The legal status of Portuguese merchants as French subjects, however, heightened rather than diminished suspicions about their religious fidelity. So just to give you an example, in 1688, a royal official sent from Paris um, with the charge of protecting Portuguese merchants in the region made clear that their crypto-Judaism was an open secret. Writing back to Paris, he spoke of, quote, the Jews who reside in this province under the name of Portuguese. Les Juifs qui sont dans cette région sous le nom de Portugais. So everybody knew what the Portuguese term meant. The point is that invisibility was a threat, not a positive threat. The absence of status segregation did not relieve Portuguese merchants and their families from the animosity of the local population, which regarded them as religious infidels, political traitors for their proximity to Spain, uh, France's foes, and cunning economic rivals. But Bordeaux was unique in adopting a policy of toleration that was premised on the religious invisibility of Jews. For all other European rulers who sought to attract Sephardic merchants fleeing Iberia, Venice was the model. There, a different kind of invisibility set in place. And I'm going to spend a little more time on Venice, not only because it is obviously the fictional setting of uh, Shakespeare's play, but also because um, this paradigmatic example shows how the religious and economic privileges that were tailored to Iberian exiles, on the one hand, clarified the distinctions between the two spheres, the religious and the economic sphere, and on the other, made apparent the inevitable conflation between the two spheres, the religious and the economic sphere. From 1397 to 1516, the Venetian Republic only allowed Jews to visit the city by the day and for specific, region, or specific reasons, notably to trade or to um, offer medical services to the urban population. They had to live on the mainland, and at the time, there was no bridge. The first bridge between the mainland and Venice was built by the Austrians in the middle of the 19th century, and then the fascist regime added the, the car bridge, but at the time, that Venice was an island. In the early 16th century, deteriorating commercial fortunes and mounting fiscal and military pressures prompted the Venetian Senate to revise this policy and accommodate Jews in the physical and social fabric of the city. So in 1516, Jews were assigned a residential area in the outskirts of the urban precincts, which was called the ghettos the first time. The term is used, I don't know if there's a pointer here, if not, it's okay. You see that uh, green area, is, this is a, a, a bird's eye view from 1500. The green area is the ghetto. The red area is the central market, Rialto, where Shylock and Antonio seal their deal. Um, the yellow, there's the Rialto Bridge, the San Mark, which is the political center. The red is the economic center, yellow is the a political center, and that large, large area is the arsenal, which at the time was the largest, uh, one, probably the largest industrial uh, plant in Europe. The ghetto was accessible via two entrances, which were guarded day and night, and closed from sundown to dusk in order to limit the interactions between Jews and Christians. The guards were Christians, but the Jewish community had to pay their wages. From an initial 700, the number of Jewish residents peaked at 2,600 in the 1640s and dwindled to 1,600 by the time Napoleon ordered the 
doors of the ghetto opened. And we've talked with Dr. Viterbi about, you know, how Italian Jews are few. Today, there are 30,000 Jews in Italy. It's very few. But they have, a, you know, an important cultural heritage. But even the Jews in Venice who have this, you know, outsized uh, role, um, in fact, they've always been numerically small. In 1541, the Venetian government responded positively to a petition by certain traveling Jewish merchants from the Levant, from the Ottoman Empire, asking, to, asking for an enlargement of the ghetto, so the ghetto so they too could settle there. The new area, the new area was uh, um, counterintuitively called the New Ghetto because the first one, uh, which had been established in 1516, was the first one, and so it had been called the Old Ghetto. Um, sorry, I'm saying the opposite. The, the 1516 is called the New Ghetto because obviously it's the first one, and so when they enlarged it, it was called the Old Ghetto, which is, sort of, which is why to this day I continue to confuse the two. That's not terribly important. Um, the point that is important is that while granting this request, the Senate imposed a condition. Those Jews hailing from the Ottoman Empire were not allowed to engage in pawnbroking, in the retail of second-hand clothes, and in any occupation except for the sole mercantile activities. In other words, guided by the desire to contain and subordinate Jews while also extracting the maximum economic utility from them, in the first half of the 16th century, the Republic created two tiers of Jewish residents along economic and supposedly clear ethnic lines. Italian and Ashkenazi Jews were confined to consumer credit and small-scale retail of used goods, while the more lucrative import-export trade, uh, which uh, was reserved for Levantine Jews, and that itself was an exception to the mercantilist rule that until then had assigned that prerogative exclusively to patricians such as uh, Antonio himself. And I'm not going to go into, but Shylock would be a kind of a mix of a Sephardic and an Ashkenazi real-life Jew. That's Having enticed several Jewish traders from Istanbul, Salonika, and other Ottoman centers in order to undermine its rival power in the Eastern Mediterranean, Venice nevertheless imprisoned and confiscated the assets of some of them during its war against the Ottomans in 1570-73. This episode highlighted the insecurity to which Jews remained exposed in Venice. So faced with the opportunity to who new Christians fleeing Iberia after the establishment of the Portuguese Inquisition, the government in Venice decided to eliminate this possible ambiguity. And in 1589, the Senate promised all Levantine or Panentine Jews, Levant mean East, Panent being West, so Panentine Jews or Sephardic Jews coming from the West from Iberia, so the charter promised all those who were willing to make Venice their homeland, their patria naturale, that they would be neither banished nor expropriated in case of war. This clause rendered Levantine and Panentine Jews equal to Venetian subjects with regard to their property rights, even in wartime. However, the Senate knew that not even this unparalleled guarantee was sufficient to induce the descendants of Iberian Jews who had been obliged to convert to Catholicism to move to Venice, where the Inquisition could try them as apostates, that is, as baptized Catholic who were not behaving as good Catholics. A prolonged trial against a Marrano born in Lisbon, which ended in 1573 with his condemnation in Venice, made clear to new Christians fleeing Iberia that the risks that they faced in this Catholic state in Venice were still there. So to prevent the situation from repeating itself, and in defiance of the papacy, the 1589 charters stipulated that Levantine and Ponentine Jews could worship freely as long as they wore the yellow hat that all Jews had to sport, meaning they renounced their Catholicism and moved into the ghetto. 
The charters also pledged that they would not, quote, be molested because of their religion by any magistrates. This was another extraordinary concession. It granted immunity to Iberian refugees in breach of canon law and deprived the local inquisition, which was staffed by both Roman clergymen and Venetian patricians, of the power to inquire into the religious conduct and belief of these immigrants prior to their arrival in Venice and thus shielded Sephardic capital from confiscation because the Inquisition, in addition to um, you know, trying Jews, also confiscated their properties. Since the Inquisition had no jurisdiction over Jews, as long as they practiced their religion within the confines of the ghetto after settling in Venice, they were assured a level of security that was either though unheard of in any European state. Venice's model of toleration that stressed separation, not invisibility. At the same time, it created another kind of invisibility, one rooted in contractual freedom and the possibilities of mingling that it, it occasioned for the wealthiest elite. Jewish societies in Venice, as everywhere, was highly stratified with masses of poor and a few families at the top of the pyramid. Sephardic merchants involved in international trade so to, sought to distinguish themselves from their rank and files in the ghetto and to blend in once they walk out of its doors. The most affluent among them adopted the attire of the upper echelon of Venetian society. And this is a passage from a well-known diary of an Englishman who uh, came to Venice on the early version of the Grand Tour just about a decade after The Merchant of Venice was published in 1600. So you can read it for yourself. You, can, you notice the surprise, which tells you a lot. In 1933, uh, Cecil Roth, partially inspired by this very passage, already noted that unlike the actors performing Shylock in theaters the world over, the prosperous merchants of the Sephardic nation living in the Venice ghetto, quote, dressed in full contemporary fashion. And a very rare portrait from the time lends credence to Roth and visualizes one facet of the conundrum with which Portia was grappling. Josef Baruch Carvalho, the Shion of a Sephardic uh, banking and uh, commercial clan, is painted here on the eve of his marriage to a Sephardic woman from another trading family, Sara Belilios. His appearance, his appearance renders him virtually indistinguishable from a patrician of Antonio's stature. <coughs> There is no denying the novelty of the measures enacted by Venice in order to favor the settlement of Sephardic merchants and the process of acculturation that they set in motion. But the doors of the ghetto continue to shut at night even for merchants like Carvalho and their legal and sartorial invisibility amplified rather than quelled widespread anti-Jewish sentiments. Other European rulers followed in the footsteps of the Venice Republic, still in each city, local vari variations of the normative and social balance between status, subordination, and contractual equality shaped the everyday life of Jews and their ability to forge credit ties with non-Jews. In 1591-93, the Medici Grand Dukes of Tuscany borrowed from the Venetian example, but went several steps further. For example, in Livorno, there was no ghetto. There was an area behind the synagogue where most poor Jews lived, but the wealthy one could live in the same, uh, import, in the same main street uh, and could even have uh, Christian tenants. Uh, although they had to have separate staircases. <laughs> uh, Jews in Livorno were not required uh, to wear a distinctive sign had, it had been ordered by the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. 
And they were even allowed to own a full, uh, own real estate full right, which in Venice they couldn't. They could even own land in the countryside. And as additional recognition of their social standing, they could own slaves, captives in the, from the Mediterranean, and employ Christian domestic servants and wet nurses in their homes. Mimicking the norms set by Venice for Levantine Jews in 1541, the Medici promoted the mercantile profile of the Jewish settlement in Livorno by prohibiting the newcomers from trading in secondhand goods and from opening pawn shops. So they were only exclusively involved in regional and long distance trade. Unlike in Venice, the Medici delegated ample jurisdictional power to the Jewish nation of Livorno. This tribunal was unique in the Jewish world insofar as it was staffed by lay syndics, they were called the Massari, and it adjudicated according to multiple sources of law, not just Jewish law, halakha, but also Roman uh, civil law, Tuscan statutes, uh, and mercantile customs. Thus, Jewish merchants in Livorno enjoyed at the same time complete equality of contract and a distinctive degree of corporate autonomy. This coexistence of individualism and collectivism distinguished their experience from that of other Sephardim. It is important to add that a number of articles in the charter that created the Jewish community of Livorno aimed explicitly at protecting Jews from physical aggression and the generalized enmity of the local population. For example, Article 20 sanctioned anyone committing, quote, insults or violence against Jews celebrating their holidays. This is an indirect but clear evidence that Jewish merchants had to contend with stigmatization and antagonism that in practice curbed their formal legal equality in the marketplace. Amsterdam represents yet another model of striking a balance between contractual equality and status subordination. Religious freedom for everyone, except Catholics and Muslims, was unmatched in Amsterdam. And of course, after the creation of the United Provinces in 1579, the Spanish Inquisition had no place there. Moreover, Amsterdam became the early modern European city that most resembled what contemporary social scientists called an open access society, a society of contract in which everybody have the same uh, rights. For those involved in long distance trade and finance, an individual legal status was irrelevant. In order to outcompete Amsterdam, its rival in the Catholic Southern Low Countries, and attract traders from near and far, the Amsterdam authorities, the municipal authorities, which had more autonomy than other um, in other areas of Europe, the Amsterdam municipal authorities to cite a specialist made, quote, every effort to secure the freedom of individual merchants to trade in the products and markets of their choice. Guild membership remained mandatory in most artisanal crafts and for marine insurance broker, though not for underwriters. However, no distinction was made between local and foreign merchants when it came to charging custom duties or providing legal and financial services. This is very, very, very rare. In most of early modern Europe, to be a citizen gives you certain fiscal and other privileges. The Amsterdam City Council not only discouraged but actually prohibited the creation of corporate semi-autonomous colonies of foreign merchants. And in exchange for this loss of self-rule, it made available to any merchant, regardless of their religious affiliation or, or, or geographical provenance, a panoply of legal and economic institutions designed to facilitate commercial and financial transactions. The most important of these was the exchange bank, the Visa Bank, where anyone uh, who wished to transact in bills of exchange, which were the most important financial instrument of the time, had to open an account. 
by operating as a central clearinghouse for private merchant, merchants, the Wissel Bank reduced the information costs that each merchant had to bear in determining the solvency of potential creditors and attracted deposits from all the principal foreign traders in town, and in so doing, it rendered the credit market more impersonal. In principle, everyone trading in Amsterdam could also obtain fast, fair, and affordable, and affordable justice for a number of specialized courts. You see some uh, listed here that uh, um, you know, ensured the fast and fair process of uh, commercial litigation, or they could also appeal uh, to the Supreme Court of Holland and the Estates General. While the Amsterdam authorities wished to dissolve all forms of corporate representation by foreign merchants, the confessional nature of the Dutch Calvinist state allowed for some degrees of corporatism when it came to religious communities, except for the Catholics, as I said, that were excluded from the Dutch tolerance regime. Like every non-Calvinist confession and some Calvinist dissenters too, Jews were entitled to a limited degree of self-government and required to take care of their own poor. The absorption of Jews in the confessional structure of the United Providence is evidenced, for example, by the fact that Dutch authorities sometimes use the expression Jews church. Peg would have to con correct my, my Dutch Jodenkirk uh, or something to that effect, which is a really striking um, expression that signals this parallelism between the regime of toleration that was uh, granted to Christian denominations and to Jews. The syndics of the Sephardic and Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam, they were called Pagrasim, came from the upper crust of its mercantile elite. As the historian Josef Kaplan has shown, their interest in regulating religious conformity was inseparable from their desire to enhance their reputation in the eyes of potential Christian business partners. So they promoted what Kaplan calls bon judaismo, which is a rather peculiar synthesis of Orthodox Judaism and Gentile respectability. By sanctioning inopportune interactions between Jews and Christians, the Parnassim wished at once to avert Christian hostility and to promote the community's public image. Besides infringing on religious observance, improper behavior damaged Jews' collective reputation and credibility. In 1645, for example, the community condemned those who left the synagogue while the service was still ongoing because, the statute says, in addition to this behavior causing a diminution of piety and an injury to the worship of the Lord, the behavior also aroused grazed reproach among us and among the Goim, the non-Jews. In 1677, after brokers had already been forbidden from talking business before or after public prayers, community leaders prohibited the trading of stock market shares on the patio of the synagogue and its immediate vicinities. Public decorum was a constant preoccupation and often displayed a class character. Although there was no enclosed ghetto in Amsterdam, a fairly sharply demarcated zone of Jewish space, as Adam Sutcliffe has called it, emerged, in which the poor figure prominently in street life. The efforts at disciplining relations between Jews and non-Jews targeted first and foremost the humblest member of the community including the crowds that became unruly during religious festivals such as Purim. The community by laws used a telling language. They speak of the need to preserve tranquility, quieta sao. In short, the poor Jews of Amsterdam enjoyed incomparable freedom from status constraint, but theirs was no emancipation ante literam. In the interest of time, I'm going to be extremely succinct with regard to London, my last case. Oh, first, uh, this is uh, um, one of the richest bankers uh, of Portuguese and Sephardic origin in Amsterdam. And here, 
uh, the level of cul acculturation is even more striking than in Carvalho's uh, painting from the Venice ghetto. Expelled from England in 1290, Jews were tacitly readmitted in 15, excuse me, were tacitly readmitted in 1656 after the Amsterdam rabbi Menasseh ben Israel prevailed on Cromwell. Like in Amsterdam, in London too, Jews were not obliged to join a congregation. This does not mean that they could pass undetected. All Jews were considered foreigners and only British subjects were allowed to participate in long distance trade within the empire. Only a few Sephardic merchants could afford the high cost of obtaining a denizen act, a denization act, uh, which was the prerequisite to acquire the legal rights and the contractual equality in the commercial arena. So let me conclude. Bordeaux was the city in Europe where, outside of Iberia, Portia question would have had a literal rather than allegorical meaning. But its resonance was much wider. In the early 1590s, just before Shakespeare was at work on The Merchant of Venice, a few cities of Western Europe, beginning with Venice, implemented legal changes in the status of new Christians and their descendants hailing from Iberia that magnified and gave new instantiations to deep-seated fears of the possible conflation between Jews and Christians. In Venice, Livorno, Amsterdam, and to a lesser extent London, these fears had less to do with Sephardic Jews' religious identity than with their newly acquired legal parity with Christian merchants. At the same time, no government lifted the many other discriminatory measures that weighed on Jews and which limited their civil rights and deprived them of all political rights. The precise extent to which Shakespeare was aware of these historical changes and meant Portia's puzzlement as a commentary on them cannot be ascertained. Portia's question is nevertheless symptomatic of the apprehension caused by Jewish religious and legal invisibility and the difficulty of drawing a neat boundary between the religious and social spheres in which status continued to matter and the marketplace, where, at least in principle, contractual equality erased all status considerations. My current work seeks to determine whether and how different models of toleration led Sephardic merchants in Livorno and in Amsterdam to develop different models of business organization. That is, if the more impersonal former rules and the greater religious toleration that they experience in Amsterdam propel them to seal credit contracts with a wide variety of non-Jewish actors of whether and how religious identity continued to shape their business alliances. My time is up and my research is admittedly still in its infancy, so uh, instead of summarizing it here, I just hope to have at least shown you why the question matters for how we tell the story of the making of European capitalism as a non-linear process and why Sephardic merchants are a particularly revelatory case or test case of the interplay of status segregation and contractual equality in the marketplace. If emancipation was a gradual process, the notorious backlashes it engendered should be less rather than more surprising in light of the potent fears that Jewish legal and religious invisibility elicited even before emancipation. But to rethink the movement from status to contract in light of the experience of Western Sephardic merchants has an even larger import, one that the grim reality around us should make self-evident. In most Western liberal capitalist democracies today, skyrocketing economic inequality is voiding former contractual equality for the most vulnerable segments of the citizenry. Evidently, we cannot separate an institutional analysis of the rise of individualistic market rules 
from the social, cultural, and economic dynamics that gave meaning to those rules. In this respect, the combination of incipient contractual equality and religious discrimination the Sephardic Jews experience in pre-emancipation Europe is instructive. Thank you. Would you like to take a Absolutely. yourself? Uh, yes, I think, uh, okay. unless you, yeah, happy to. I'll take a sip while people think if they have comments or questions. Thanks. One of the things you might want to do is look at um, the way the Jews were treated in the, under the Inquisition in France, namely at Avignon. And there is a very grim story, actually, of, um, of children being taken in by Christian families and trying to convert them and so forth. So you, you have a, 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 an example right there of uh, Within, within France itself, of a, a treatment that was um, retrograde, to, see, to say the least. Yes, and, and you've written important pages on, on, on that. Um, I would only say that Avignon was not part of the Kingdom of France, which is why there was an Inquisition. But uh, precisely because the Jews in Avignon were so mistreated and also so poor, a fair number of them um, fled and tried to settle in Bordeaux, where the Portuguese merchants, ostensibly Portuguese merchants, and later after 1723, um, some joined, uh, embraced Judaism openly, treat them very badly and occasionally expel them because of the, you know, this is the question of the, let me put it, it, it's a good example of what I was trying to say, and perhaps wasn't that clear, that for certain members of these mercantile communities, particularly Jews, even when they had formal legal rights as individuals, which is a novelty of this period, in the Middle Ages, Jews only have collective rights, they can never feel that they can treat it as individuals, that their personal behavior can be separated from the behavior of the community. So I won't remember the exact date, probably in the 1770s, there is a, a trial in Bordeaux against some uh, Jewish and Christian underwriters after a shipwreck, the Francia family and uh, others are tried for not paying the indemnity to the insurer. And uh, the population uses this trial to mount a deeply um, anti-Semitic campaign. Um, and one of the ways in which the Jewish community reacts is by kicking out the Avignon poor Jews from the city, which there is no, the only way to explain that is because these individual, the trial was to specific individuals the members of the Francia family who had underwrote, underwritten this policy. But the, the climate was tainted by the presence of Jews who were more easily, even more easily demonized. So there is this dynamic between what are the former rules of engagements, including before a tribunal, and the way of managing a collective reputation that never, can never be contained by an individual, they always transcend. And that, I think, resonates with you know, issues we have become aware today about things we call structural inequality, things that go beyond what an individual themselves can control. And this, um, this coexistence of the rules that should, in theory, apply to an individual, whether you're Jewish or Christian, on paper, it doesn't make any difference for the ruling of the tribunal, but the social and religious structure in which you're involved. So that, that's where the Avignon Jews creeping in to Bordeaux, they alter the equilibrium there. Yes, please. Yeah, um, in, during uh, Shylock's daughter uh, gets into a relationship with 
were there rules against miscegenation, and were they male to female, or female to male, or did it matter? You know, I think they make a big deal in the play. Yes. Male and female. So all forms of um, sexual relations between Jews and, and Christians are forbidden everywhere, including in Amsterdam. Um, as you remember, Jessica, Charlotte's daughter, converts. That's why she can elope with her Christian lover, and that's another tale of sort of the winning of Venetian Christian society over the over the ghetto. But uh, awesome. yes, there were you know there were Jewish prostitutes. That's well known. You know there was exploitation of uh, both gender and uh, social and economic uh, inferiorities and structures of power. So that would be more frequent than, uh, than otherwise. That, that's, uh, but that is one thing that was um, prohibited everywhere, in every form. Yes? Why the transposition that the uh, uh, ghetto Whoa. Yes. Was settled before the ghetto. Yeah, I got I got um, uh, 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 very confused about that because it's the first ghetto. Fifteen sixteen is the first one, so it's called new because nothing existed before. Um, yeah, that I, I I don't know exactly, but you know it, it's sort of it, because it comes after. That's the name they give. And then the third one is called Ghetto Nuovissimo, the most new of all. Um, but uh, that's why, even if I should not to get confused with them, as you can tell, I did get confused because it is confusing. But it's new because it's the first. Sarah. Um, I have a question about the, um, the taxonomy of the different um, Jewish merchants in Venice. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where Livornese Jews would fall. Yes. Would they be Italian? Or would they be? There would be there would be Panentine. So the the Jewish community in Livorno rapidly become wealthier than the Venice one. Um, there is primarily a movement of certain Sephardic Jews from Venice to Livorno, but there are also you know smaller numbers, but the Belilios and the Carvalho have family members in both, which may be why that uh, prompted your question. Um, the Jewish community as a community in Venice was poor, but there were individual wealthy members. That's sort of one of the findings uh, <clears throat> that Jewish historian has established. It's sort of the, the um, economic decline of the community as an administrative unit didn't reflect on the general decline of a few families. But they would be considered Ponentine Jews that, or, or, or Portuguese. They had separate, um, I do have a, they had separate synagogues. So um, there are five synagogues in Venice. Um, and uh, uh, the Ponentine, uh, the, the Scuola Spagnola, the Sephardic synagogue, which is the last one, was also the most imposing. And one way in which these, so within the ghetto, there is no ethnic segregation, but there are no, pat, you know, we don't have, the, the one census which I found many, many years ago from 1633 gives you the list of households, but not in which houses. But I think it's fairly clear that there were no, you know, ethnic lines uh, or subdiv ethnic subdivisions within the ghetto, but the worshiping was um, separated. And the Italian Ashkenazi synagogues, they are the earliest one. As you can tell, they're more, they're the most disguised. They look like a, almost like a, a house floor. Um, while the Spanish synagogue, which is the last one, is the most grandiose. Um, and that would be the ones to which the Livernese Jews would worship. Sabo, did you have? Yes, uh, I have two questions about time. The first one, well, I'll begin by saying thank you for that. Typically, Tribarato, uh, like uh, a stellar performance. I learned a lot from this talk, and uh, it made me think about uh, some of the things that I've, I've been working on, uh, largely by interacting with you. And those things have to do with the self-governing structures of each of these diaspora communities. So towards the end of your talk, you mentioned, or you alluded to the uh, the Parnassim and the, uh, the Imposta, the, I forget, the Muhammad and the Anjara as governing institutions. And that made me think, 
Uh, is there, do you notice any uh, correlations between the external structure of the host society and the way that the internal structure of self-governance is affected by it? And namely, I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, how do you compare the Venetian? Did the, did the Venetian Jews in the ghetto have their own version of the Muhammad and their representatives? And how do you compare these two with, uh, within the, at least the Jewish diaspora itself? So that's the first question. The second one is more, more of a comment and a question as well, which is how do you situate this new work of yours in light of the two earlier works? I, I tend to see this as a kind of fusion of the two, but I'm wondering if you want to elaborate on that. Thank you, Sebu. Um, so the first question is important, and I, I, I was um, I was a bit succinct, but um, there's a bit of a paradox whereby, so Livorno is an exception in all the Jewish world, not only because the rulers of the, the, the judges in the tribunals are not rabbis, they're merchants, but also because they have an extraordinary latitude in what they can adjudicate. All civil disputes between Jews have to first go before a Jewish tribunal and can only be appealed to the Christian tribunal and some minor criminal uh, acts are also adjudicated. And this is just, you know, the Medici basically they, they delegate their job, you know, like it's a lot of work for early modern states, they, they don't have great state capacity and so if they can farm out the work, it's a very typical, um, you know, so the self-governing Yes, but you also lose control of, the, of the, a lot of things that go on in that community. Venice um, had much uh, narrower um, religious freedom compared to Amsterdam and uh, uh, a very strict, as I, you know, segregation. There's no ghetto in Amsterdam. But like in Amsterdam, Jews could only, their only degree of self-government was about poor relief, essentially. And that's the similitude with Amsterdam. Um, obviously, through poor relief and some, and not only poor, the, the level of self-governing was through mediation. So Jews could arrange to have um, a rabbi or, or a secular mediator. And, uh, you know, these communities, back then and even more than today, you know, there's a lot of social pressure. So what are the former roles and what are the expectations? But paradoxically, for opposite reasons, in both the cities, uh, Jews had very limited self-governance. If there was a, a major dispute, they had to be adjudicated by the local government, which is why Shiluk appears before the Duke, in the, in, which is the Doge, in, in Shakespeare's. Um, so uh, you're kind uh, to, because to, uh, you and I have been um, in conversation for many years. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a prelude. I mean, a lot of what I said is well known, you know, to be frank. I'm just putting it into a framework that is a bit more comparative than usual to, you know, my question is how then the business, you know, the let's say this, put it uh, bluntly, economic historians assume that in Amsterdam with these rules, religion stopped to matter. And, uh, and everybody you know, did business with everyone because there were these fair and personal infrastructure. Uh, Jewish historians of Amsterdam assume that Sephardim had uh, family farms. And it's just a perspective from which you come into the story. But because of the nature of archival resources in Am archival um, collections in Amsterdam, um, it's actually we know very little about how Jews organize their their business. And so I'm trying. And as of now, um, I would say that for the work I've done so far, um, there are a lot of similitude between Livorno and Amsterdam. Um, but there's also some differences. But the question is how these formal rules allow for greater or lesser interactions between Jews and non-Jews, and part of my answer is that it's never a yes or no answer. And that's where business history can contribute to cultural history, because 
Jewish merchants do certain things with other Jewish merchants and other things with non-Jews. It's, it's not a yes or no, and the reason why they choose their partners and associates and business uh, uh, counterparts has to do with the former rules of the place and has to do with the kind of risks that different contracts entail. And I think it's important to, to do this kind of economic history that is uh, informed by the, not just the former rules, but also a notion of what these cultural level of, of integration and discrimination, how that played. So that we don't go from, you know, closureness to openness, but we have different levels of engagement. So there was a question back then. Yes. Uh, your, your lectures, you know, macro level about what the rules were in every one of these societies. Shylock is a history of an individual and how he basically behaved. And I'm curious, what was the life of call it the ordinary merchant, Jewish merchant, in all of these areas, whether it was in Bordeaux or whether it was in Venice or uh, in Amsterdam, did they communicate with each other? Did, what was their life, you know, did, did their life resemble the life of Shylock? You know, it, we, this whole thing is supposed to tie into Shylock and I'm trying to understand how did the Sephardic community in all of these places did they share something with Shylock, or is this something that just Shakespeare invented? So, thank you. Um, I've tried to speak about Portia more than Shylock. Um, Shylock is a composite imagine, a fictional, you know, the, the work of fiction. There's no such thing as Shylock. There is not an Italian Ashkenazi Jew who can lend 6,000 6, ducats uh, because they could only operate pawn shops. But I, I don't think we should test the veracity of Shakespeare's imagination. I don't think that's productive. Um, the, there were Jewish merchants I was hinting at of very different varieties, very different level of wealth, and very different level of orthodoxy and acculturation. There are Jewish merchants, as you saw in, the, in these two paintings, that had no beard. Jewish men are supposed to have a beard. Um, and that's a, you know, then Shiloh would have had a beard as probably, but we don't know who Shiloh. We, we cannot pin down. There's, there's not a social figure that map onto the um, literary character. They were in contact with each other, yes. They wrote each other a lot of letters. Many spoke different languages. Um, in the Western Sephardic diaspora, which is sort of different parts of the Sephardic world that Sarah uh, studies, they would not speak a uh, right Ladino. They, um, they're, um, those who were merchants often knew very little, if any, Hebrew, rather than a few prayers. Uh, their brothers and cousins who were studying uh, religious texts would know. Um, they would know Portuguese often phonetically if they had been born abroad. So they, um, their Portuguese and their, and their Spanish was very were very inflected by the local languages. So in, there's a linguist who studied the Spanish and Portuguese language in Amsterdam and speaks of a suffocation. That's an expression he uses between Dutch and Iberian languages. In Livorno, uh, the, the, the Sephardic merchants, uh, they use uh, Portuguese in written uh, letters, but they have a kind of Italian verb declension, so it's also very hybrid. But they have a notion like when they write to Algiers, they write in Spanish. When they write to Bordeaux, they write in Spanish. When they write to Amsterdam, they write in Portuguese. They also know a number of you know, European languages to operate in the Eastern Mediterranean. You have to know Italian. It was good if you know French. Um, so there, there, there aren't, particularly in Amsterdam, unfortunately, there are very few Sephardic letters, that business, record, business letters that survive. In Bordeaux, they've not been studied enough, but they're a very large collection of business letters. 
Um, in Livorno, there's one large one that I studied. So yes, they communicated. They even married their daughters to each other. Uh, the concept of male brides can be found in these, uh, in these letters um, because it was an important way of building <coughs> commercial capital and alliances. Um, but there was a very, you know, there was a sense of class consciousness between, you know, the upper echelon uh, were different from local traders who were still Sephardic and much poorer. So there was a, you know, the socioeconomic segregation uh, existed within these societies as well. Yes? What were the terrible offenses to which Jews were excommunicated from their community? Yes, so that um, in Amsterdam was a particularly well documented, the harem. Uh, it's Josef Kaplan, the scholar who has put his fingers, uh, who studied this phenomenon the most. Uh, we usually think of Spinoza. Spinoza was the exception. He was one of the very, very few who was expelled forever. Most of these expulsion or so-called excommunications were temporary. Uh, they were the matters of days or weeks during uh, the person was not allowed to participate in communal rights. And Kaplan has made um, a persuasive argument that um, the members of the communities, uh, this was something that mattered, they were sensitive to that. Uh, and so that was another, um, and that's another way of responding to Seba's question. It was an, in, it was an important instrument of um, peer pressure of internal coercion that was uh, um, something, and, and in two occasions, the Amsterdam municipal authorities threatened to take away that power from the leaders of the Sephardi communities because uh, they felt that that was a way in which the Parnassim wielded a power that rivaled with uh, the uh, <clears throat> municipal authorities. Uh, so that, that it was an important uh, instrument of self-discipline within the community. Um, thank you for a great talk. Um, so I wondered about this connection that you mentioned between these European cities and uh, the Ottoman cities that you mentioned, especially Salonika, but also Istanbul. And I'm curious um, what the rationale was, this, this sort of, uh, uh, the impetus or the, the dependency on someone like Istanbul in particular, and the communities there, and the far communities there. What was motivating uh, that connection, that dependency? And does it have anything to do with your answer to an earlier question about early modern states sort of farming out uh, certain skill sets and, and duties and so on? Yeah, this is, it's a bit of a chronological uh, change over time. Uh, a fair number of Jews, the largest number that left, did not accept Baptists, left Spain and Portugal, went to the Ottoman Empire where there was much greater religious tolerance. Uh, but after the 1540s, about the time when these uh, Ottoman Jews petitioned the Venetian, um, <clears throat> the economic conditions in Venice were better and later in Livorno. So it was mostly um, in search for economic opportunities that uh, a number of Sephardic merchants left Ottoman cities for Venice, Livorno, and then later, you know, Amsterdam, London as well. But the way in which the communities were organized was very different. In the Ottoman Empire, um, only rabbis could um, adjudicate disputes. There was no form of uh, mercantile elite that ruled. Um, and later, particularly after the 1670s, there are some Sephardic merchants who move from Venice and Livorno to the Ottoman Empire, but they do so under the protection of the French crown. So they move there essentially with the status of French subjects. And that's a deal that the French crown makes with them because the French crown doesn't want Jews in Marseille, or better, the French crown would like Jews in Marseille, but the Marseille merchants don't want Jews in Marseille. Um, but they have greater expertise in, on, in the Levantine markets. So the, the way the Sephardic Jews sort of return 
to the Ottoman Empire is as Franks, which is the Ottoman term that refers to, um, to, <clears throat> to Europeans, to Westerners. So much so that there, there's, uh, there are travel accounts and local accounts that they, you know, Sephardic, uh, of, of Ottoman Sephardic Jews being quite displeased uh, with these uh, supposed kin who pretend, you know, to be westernized. And that sort of long before the, the alliance, I mean, these are, these are fractures within Sephardic communities in the Ottoman Empire that long precede the kind of westernization that comes with the Alliance Francaise in the, in the 19th century. Um, so they, they, you know, they dress differently. They dressed, as you saw in this picture, and, uh, and the Ottoman Jews think that they're sort of, uh, you know, they're being snobbed by these uh, Frank Jews. Um, but that, they do that because depending on, is this, you know, this identification issue, it's, it's not identity, it's identification. Depending on your legal status, you pay different custom duties, you have access to different market. So you can be from the same family, but if you're identified, if you're categorized as a French protective merchant, you can do things that if you are the cousin from Salonika and an Ottoman subject, you cannot do. So is there somebody else behind me? Yes, but I maybe. Th thank you very much. Not being an academic, I learn all this through reading fiction. David Liss's books. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. They're very accurate and wonderful novels. Yes. I wish I could, so I do this boring stuff because I cannot no, write no, like no, David no, Liss. No, no, no. Yes. For it. Yeah, the coffee traders. The coffee yes. Trader, the paper, what is it? Papers. papers. Yes. They're fabulous. Yes. They're very, very accurate. And they're very accurate. You can, you can rely on them. Yes. Was there a, one question maybe? Then? Yeah. Um, during Shakespeare's time, there were no Jews in England. And as far as I know, there's been some speculation that Shakespeare left England for some period of time, but very little is known. And yet this kind of presumes a fairly intimate knowledge by Shakespeare of what was going on in Venice. And I'm just wondering, is there any evidentiary basis for that? Do we know anything about that? So quickly, maybe three comments. First, I, I don't have too time to go in, but actually the merchant of Venice does not show great knowledge of Venice. That's sort of the point. Um, second, there were no Jews, although some scholars have tried to argue that there were a few new Christians, including a court in those years, and particularly the new Christians were those who, as I noted, elicited the greatest anxiety about the invisibility of you know, the Jew who live under you know, Christian attire among ourselves. And thirdly, and most uh, universally, it doesn't take the presence of Jews or a minority for hatred against those people to exist. In fact, uh, I mean, Poland today would be a fairly well-known example, but it's well known that you don't need uh, individuals in flesh and bones because prejudice and stereotypes, in fact, are not rooted in their real life around you. Um, so the absence of Jews is not something that um, assure the absence of negative stereotypes about Jews. That would be my fairly quick answer to your very complex question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.